Okay, do we have audio or? Yeah. Yeah. Okay, cool. Um, so anyway, the, uh, um, so, uh, Uh, I'm, I'm getting more and more frazzled the more things fail. And uh, I also have to do some things to the, to the side here. Um, and so the, um, the every, that was the Hannibal Lecter, Silence of the Lambs, uh, every frame of painting. And it is something that I, most of the time, end up doing in terms of editing for other people. Um, the video talked about like winning the scene, but the big thing I wanted to talk, wanted you guys to learn from that is how the camera conveys whose perspective we're in and how the camera can hop perspectives. Um, Katie, you had a question about like, so Katie asked that I said that the camera is always in th past tense and, uh, that's not what I meant to say. The, um... The camera is always in present tense. It is telling you of a now. Um, the the camera may be a different. Um, what I was saying is different aspect ratios and things and like black and white and things like that can make it speak in an old timey language, but it's always speaking in a now, whether it's speaking now now or whatever or or the a previous now, a flashback to a now. Uh, when Kurosawa's 50, 1950 movie is being played, you're in a 1950 now. That's actually taking place. Sorry, that actually Rashomon takes place in like Samurai Days, so that's actually like in that now. Uh, part of every piece of art creating its its um, every piece of art creating its world there's also a time that world exists right um and the audience is taken to a specific time now it could be past tense and you know what i found the first film that but it's not done with the camera well i guess one argument you can make is star wars is uh, a long long time ago in a galaxy far far away or galaxy which one? Which one's two? I think it's a long time ago in a galaxy far, far away, and um, but even then, it's like the camera then just takes us to there, and we are existing in the time that this takes place, even though narratively there is a trope trying to get us to say now. This thing is is uh, the language. The camera always speaks present tense, like this is what's happening now, um, even if we know cognitively it was in the in the past that's what flashback language kind of does um let's see um uh but yeah so the every frame of painting should have taught us about changing perspectives and how the camera language tells us whose perspective we're in um and uh and how it can go back and forth the big important part of that is also who is winning the scene. This is very important. Whenever I'm editing a book, it's almost always that that I'm doing, is that people have dialogue or even logistical dialogue or exposition, but it's like they don't have a contest. They don't have conflict. They don't have a discussion, basically, of who is winning the scene. Uh, dramatic action is everything right and dramatic action is characters making choices to create conflict or overcome conflict to advance the plot or change the paradigm of the scene or whole story um a scene is like a mini story of its own uh which means it is about conflict uh protagonist views protagonist versus antagonist fighting to get something they want uh, the thing should be something important to advancing the plot or changing the paradigm of the story. A dynamic scene has uh, characters changing tactics to better defeat each other. 
This could be a distract one character trying to distract another character or changing the subject or bribing a different angle of arguing, etc. Um, and uh, what a character wants might change as characters fail or succeed at what they want. Um, a good scene, like um, in a good short story or in good other story, you kind of have does the character win and does the character win at life, right? And so in the Silence of the Lambs scene, um, the uh, the detective is humiliated, but she got her answer from the serial killer. So she got what she wanted, but she didn't win at life. Um, the serial killer didn't want to give her what she wanted, but he got what he did want, which was to humiliate her um, or to, to toy with her, to manipulate her. And the want and the things changed, changed as they went on. Like first he was just trying to uh, toy with her, but then he had to, in order to, to, to mess with her, he had to go to humiliating her rather than just like sort of mocking her and um you know so so it was like a bigger humiliation like it was almost like a bigger win but he also had to go to extreme lengths to make that happen right whereas before he would just say a simple thing as your 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 fbi id is about to expire right to invalidate her to say you're not real fbi and so he's he's dinking away at her ego in that way um yeah, so the biggest thing, the, so when I'm editing, um, people usually have um, all the ingredients to tell a story with dramatic action, but they don't know how to organize it. And this is like the biggest thing. This is like almost anything that I'm editing. It's like I basically have to rewire all of this all everything people are doing like every scene everything because they haven't learned this one detail uh katie uh can you uh uh read lines yeah hannibal lecter definitely invented nick <laughs> um i mean in a way you can look at nagging as that kind of um you can look at nagging as that kind of scene argument is that you're taking different tactics. You're like, oh, hey, like, you know, like you you create this interaction and then you choose the tactic that is to attack her. And then once she's being attacked, like first she may be like, I don't want this guy talking to me. Then at least in the idea of that nagging works. And then it's like they tell the pickup artist to say, negative things about her so now she has to protect her ego and say i am worthy of being here so now she starts arguing her virtues against this attack and then as he starts to agree or reluctantly agree then they are starting a conversation at which point he can then try to translate that from like a cold call to a warm call to then seal the deal, I guess. Uh, so it's like a changing of tactics as you're going, so that way you can um, get what you want. Uh, in a weird way, it's like pickup artists understand the art of the scene, or they're just going to be a dick. Because like, I guess at a certain point, you have to change tactics. It's just, it's just something I would imagine would have to be. Like, you can't just be like berated. Like, that's just harassment. <laughs> Anyway, um, okay, so it's a method. It's a method. Here, let's uh, let's scooch the gooch. Gooch. Okay. All right. So let's see. So we have a scene, um, and this is what most people will end up writing, and then we'll show you what uh, what uh, thinking pickup artists try not to harass people. Yeah. Uh, I mean, eventually you have to direct to. It's almost like Ghostbusters, like you can't just be the proton stream at a certain point. You have to throw the trap, <laughs> right? You can just be the proton stream all day. You could just be the proton stream all day. <laughs> just, I don't know if they know how to be a trap. You just carry your ghosts to your house. <laughs> That's how you get sex. <laughs> no, that's rape. Yeah, oh God. 
Um, anyway, uh, so, uh, you can be my Proton stream any day. Oh my god. Whoa. Uh, giving these talks is easier when I'm, when I'm on the other screen. <laughs> anyway, um, let's, uh, let's, uh, all right. So this is what people, what even advanced fiction, like this is people with MFAs making this mistake and like decades of experience. And they'll write a scene like this. And that's how you cure cancer. Good, good, good pitch, Tyson. Very good. The Very Zen good. Cone. We need to we need to tell the doctors about this. Yeah. Um, all right. So so this is how they'll write the scene. Let's enter from the roof. Uh, it'd be easier to go around the side and see if a door is unlocked. It's worth it, even if even though we might be seen. Sounds good. And uh, so I delivered that kind of over the top because these types of scene constructions sound like Dora the Explorer and not like Avatar the Last Airbender, Can right? Can you say, sounds good? <laughs> Can you say, go around the side? <laughs> bueno! <laughs> um, and uh, so... Um, so... And so I'm always like, why is, where is, why isn't this a conflict? Why isn't this a discussion? And people will be like, well, I just want some harmony and what, you know, like, and it's like people can be kind of on the same side while still like disagreeing. There's all sorts of ways to do it, but you get a lot of like defensive reasons why they don't know how to construct a scene. And that's ultimately what it's about is it's like you, they don't know scene construction and one of my most recent frustrations is that I'm like, there's no unified teaching of writing, right? Because if you're a fiction writer, you'll never learn about structure. Never learn about like three act structure, five act structure, whatever. Um, and even when I like took a screenwriting class, I talked to one of my fiction teachers and they were like, yeah, they use the three act structure but we're better than that and i'm like all right right and so like i kind of had trouble getting into the idea of structure but then the more i had to work with it the more and i think that was the other problem too was like at uc irvine i just took a i had a screenwriting teacher who basically was like here's how to write a screenplay um and then at usc my screenwriting teacher was Sid Field who wrote the book on screenwriting so he was like here's what a screenplay is and as a formalist writer I'm very much like what is the work what are its attributes and how do you take advantage of those attributes to make the clearest best most impactful work you can design right it's like the game the, the work is design and um and so sid field really taught it to me in a way where i was like no the three act structure is like fucking everything like there's so much legitimate design to it and um whereas at uc irvine i like someone was like here's what you do here's the chart of what needs to get done and i'm just like oh okay okay that sounds restrictive and shitty right but sid field was like no here's why 
here's why this has happened. This is why this is great. And it's like, you know, a big part, because this whole thing is like, how do you start shit? How do you get things started? Um, I mean, how you start shit is just be petty as fuck. But you know how you, how that. you, I do know a lot about that. <laughs> and that, but when you're, but when you just, but when you're writing, when you're starting a work, um, a big part of it is, you need to set up what you're doing. And so a lot of that screenwriting stuff, a lot of that structure, when people start going off the rails or writing books that are way too fucking long, it's because they haven't done the basic things of decide who is the protagonist, who are the th you know, what are they doing? What are the things? And so they're just going on forever instead of looking at like, what is the hero's journey of it? Um, and so, so it's just like, indefinitely expansive which is why i always hate when i'm struggling or trying to get work done and people are like like well you can edit a thing indefinitely so just stop working and i'm like you shut the fuck up <laughs> because you don't understand shit you don't understand what you're doing you don't understand what i'm doing you that's don't why understand they can why edit forever because they don't know what they're doing they don't yeah. know what the correct thing they don't is. know what they're doing and the reason why is because there's no unified education for writing the only reason i have a unified education for writing is because i got five different writing degrees i i'm like herman hess's sid author just going fucking like learning buddhism learning capitalism learning you know learning asceticism learning all these things and so i did that just like aesthetically i just went like poetry fiction like non-fiction taking different classes learning to animate things like that and it's so it's like so i have all these different like backgrounds of aesthetics and i'm like all these things work together but then i'll see someone who just studied fiction writing and they're like i don't understand why my book exploded and it's a million pages and also and and why does the dialogue not work and it's because their dialogue is sounds good right because it's because they don't know how to structure a scene because no one ever taught them how to structure a scene or how to build conflict and so they're like well they're working as a team and it's like well you're still writing a scene it's still like there are three different types of writing rules to say like there is the paradigm and the paradigm is like impressionism modernism postmodernism that's just kind of what everyone kind of thinks is good right now and usually and this is the weakest set of writing rules because it's more like conventions more like what people kind of think things should be and basically these paradigms eventually change or end or collapse because people then move to the next fucking thing when enough people start experimenting in a new paradigm and breaking that paradigm and everyone else is like fuck that old thing and they start moving to the new thing um uh i mean the weakest form of paradigm is the goddamn trend and that's what you know i had a professor at grad school that was like i don't want to take any more classes with this person because she just kept being like you gotta follow the trend and i'm like by the time it's a trend that's over like you're trying to catch a wave by catching the end of it and it's like you have to see the wave forming you have to but if you're just trying to see what everyone else does and try to shoehorn your way into it that's the surest way to fucking fail you have to like like you've been boogie boarding with me like i'm all like see the wave that's going to be the wave you want to catch don't don't see a cool one and be like oh shit right now if you're half prepared and you're coincidentally in the right spot you'll catch a wave that's just like oh hey and you're like ah you know i've done that boogie boarding just been like ah jump on and be on the perfect wave there you are. but but sometimes you get the perfect wave and you have to like go under or hop over or let it hit you and hope you don't die um but like the but you um you're not looking at the future or the current you're not looking at the current wave you're looking at the future wave yeah you're looking at the future wave and there's a lot of things where i'm like fuck man i wish i saw that coming like uh fishbowl right mm -hmm. um like you you figured this one out i was like why are so many people using the term fishbowl and making games about 
fishbowl, like fishbowl cities, fishbowl whatever. Because uh, I'm working for a game company that did that's fishbowl. The company name the is company fishbowl. The company name is fishbowl. The original name of the game was Alma Fishbowl City, right? Because the city is a fishbowl and it's very unique to what their experience is. And so I'm like, well, why are all these like, because they're like a Chilean game company. And I'm like, so that makes sense to me. I'm like, that is their experience. So then why are all these Western fucks? Like, where where are all these, like, Occidental fucks coming, English-speaking country people drop in the word fishbowl all of a sudden? And then you were like, I'm like, what's in the zeitgeist? And you were like, oh, it's because of the pandemic. I was like, motherfucker, that's it. The I wish pandemic I... Pandemic mixed with uh, everybody looking at you yeah. through the internet. But that also proves my point, because they were building something... But games take a long time to build, especially depending on the size of your game. And so, like, people with bigger teams making kind of sh sometimes shittier games are just able to play off, of the, play off of the idea faster than they can. And so it really sucks because now they are being pushed around by the trend, right? They need to try to s differentiate themselves from the trend. The second more powerful is um is the form it's the literary form forms have restrictions so like a sonnet is 14 lines by definition i edited uh, a friend who wrote a braided essay and it wasn't a braided essay and i was like this isn't a braided essay it doesn't do what braided essays do, do. and she kind of just yelled at me and was like it is a braided essay and i and it does it because I want it to be a braided essay. And I was like, if you want it to be a braided essay, it needs to do this. Or you need... To... But I was like, but it's a great essay. It's just not a braided essay. It doesn't meet the requirements of the form. And she was just like, but I want it to be one. And I'm like, well, let's work on that. Let's change it. And then she's like, but I don't want to change it. And I'm like, well, you're kind of you're kind of at odds with what your wants are. Because basically a braided essay is like when you're thinking about three different topics and you're telling almost three different stories and then the stories start to connect in some way they have some sort of confluence where it becomes one big thing so it's like a braid right um but here's the thing like you can always break the form and have something like it Lars von Troyer Jocelyn taught me Lars von Troyer but his name is Lars von Trier. Trier. Um, Lars von Trier does, um, he's an avant-garde director. So I haven't broken down if he's following the three-act structure, but he kind of is following a structure, a, a three-act. He's following a structure that does the important things that are important to a three-act structure. So even though the screenplay is a three-act structure, that does certain things at certain times in certain ways in certain lengths he may not be doing exactly that but he still made a piece that doesn't violate the essential essences of telling a story for the screen and so um i haven't broken it down i don't know why usually i don't even have to think to break it down i'll just be like yeah this this and that for this movie i'm having trouble remembering uh so i'm just like i don't know um, but also that's, that can sometimes be, uh, I'm too good for that actually. Like, I, I don't mean I'm better than it. I mean, I have had that skill for a long time, uh, which is that usually when something is very good at the three act structure, it's almost hard to see the three act structure, which is why whenever I teach the three act structure, I show you a movie that does the three act structure badly. Um, Hulu's, uh, Chevalier uh that one does it does a three-act structure but it does so kind of poorly uh mirai does a three-act structure but it does so kind of poorly um and so that's why i taught it in season one of the high and love showcase i used mirai to teach three-act structure anyway um and then the final thing that is kind of unbreakable is the aesthetics of human response right it's like people like contrast that's universal so if you go like well i'm not going to have any contrast like um i'm going to paint a canvas straight white or something like that 
Um, I mean, you can do it, but, but then there are other dynamics, like people also like things that are the same. People like harmony. People like So these big things of human design create a web of rules like that are both contradictory but work with each other. And so you have to like learn a design sense to make sure that these things all work together. And I feel like a lot of times writers and artists like to butt against those fundamental human needs. Once we get the, the 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 driver installed, okay. But yeah, so basically, if you don't know these fundamental like design fundamentals of design, and I feel like design is what teaches the fundamentals of the human response so much better than anything else, like harmony, contrast, conflict, um, the um, you know the the. Um, anyway, so, 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 um, but anyway, so people will argue these things. Uh, so when I, so let's redo the lines. So that way, because I've digressed for too long. Um, okay. So what they write is this, let's enter from the roof. It'd be easier to go around the side and see if it's a, if a door is unlocked. It's worth it. Even if we get caught, if, even if we might be seen. Sounds good. And so then I ask them to have something that has more conflict, something that is interesting, something that has more dramatic action, something that is designed, right? And so this is more of a designed scene of that because that was just exposition, like uh, maybe a tiny bit of disagreement to have a little bit of character. But look how much with the same ingredients we could make a better scene. Let's enter from the roof. It'd be easier to go around the side and look for an unlocked window. We might get seen trying to jimmy windows, and there might not even be a way inside. Fine. You go your way, and I'll go mine. Bye, bitch. Oh my fucking god. Right, like, different characters, different... So if the plot needs to go around the side, then have a reason that forces so we both have we both have something we want we want to infiltrate the building so we're a plural protagonist we have that same goal but we can have conflict in the scene because we are arguing over method and i want my method to just do the difficult but sure way and she wants to do the easy but unsure way and so then when we argue our points she changes strategy and just says, I'm just going to go and do it. And I know you're going to follow me. And so then I lose the fucking scene because I would then go follow her. The story goes the same fucking direction. Which is going around. Which is going around the side. But the character has to earn it. The author has to fucking earn it. And so I get so frustrated when every time... These MFA people who make more money than me, who have a professional career, send me a script. I'm like, you don't know the basic. Like, this is boring as shit. Like, here, like, make it a scene. Make it something that plays out. And a lot of times their go-to is when they have a scene, they have a guy go, oh, man, you guys missed it. So... Let me explain what happened. And so now they turned a dynamic scene into exposition. And which is the worst thing. You want to turn exposition into a dynamic scene. Like I talked about it earlier with um, Independence Day. Basically in the locker room when Will Smith is being rejected by NASA. They're trying to tell you Will Smith wants to be an astronaut. Will Smith is rejected by NASA. Will Smith wants to marry a stripper. His girlfriend is a stripper, and he plans on proposing. Exposition. He could have just been like, Hi, guys. 
I'm Will Smith, and I'm going to go a ask my stripper girlfriend to marry me because I want to go to space. As you do. As you do. As you do. Yeah. And, but instead, what they did was they had him read a rejection letter. And so he's like, fuck, he's distressed. He has feelings. And then his friend is like, oh, man, I told you they were going to reject you because you're dating a stripper. They got their morals and shit. And he's just like, man, but I thought, you know, because I'm like the best fucking pilot. That's another thing. He's the best fucking pilot. And then, uh, and then they're just like, and then he's like, man, you need to just kiss some ass, which means like he's probably irreverent. He's, you know, whatever. He's like, you need to kiss some ass. And then, uh, and then the ring drops because first he's like down on his knees, like you need to kiss some ass. He's like framing it. There's framing. There's physical space work. And then Will Smith drops the ring, and then he picks up the friend picks up the ring, and he, you know, he opens it, and then a guy walks by and goes, because now, now we're thinking about the world outside this is called the pneuma this is where you have an inside space but then the outside space invades and a guy because it's the end of the world right basically and so a guy walks by sees another man in the locker room with a wedding ring down on one knee and will smith looking at him and so he looks and then he's just like don't ask don't tell this is the 90s and then he walks away <laughs> and so then you have this visual joke and then he you know he gives it back and he's just like give me that like that's for jasmine i'm gonna ask her to marry me and he's just like mm, you're gonna marry a stripper you're gonna double down on the thing that's keeping you from your dreams that's good character work that's conflict that shows you there's family oh my god that's a good scene oh my god good cinema so good why am I reading shit written by people with master's degrees? Ah! This is why I'm insane. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> or the other way around. I don't know. Maybe I'm insane. And this that's is why, why they're insane? This is why I need to learn to let go. <laughs> let go <your laughs> yeah, yeah. Talent. I need to learn to let go of my, my... Yeah, anyway. Bye, so, yeah, so... Um, so, this is the art of... So the art of starting shit. How do we start shit? We started talking about this a little bit, but this is where I am in my actual notes. First, we need to understand the role of the beginning. This is now we're talking about design and story design. This is like the rules. This is a, a, this is very like very you cannot break this. Whether you're writing the three act structure or five act structure, or one of those weird structures that some guy on the internet is selling you with a deck of cards or a notebook, the beginning needs to have beginning things. Uh, they need to tell you who the main character is. What traits do your main characters have that are important to know for the story? Oftentimes, the big difference between a good story and a bad story is whether these traits are relevant to fucking anything. If you look at Lifetime Christmas movies, they'll give you just a lot of different traits and they'll have a lot of things happen to a character that are not related to the goddamn story, but it's because the writer is following very badly a recipe book that is saying, oh, well, I need character character traits so the audience knows and relates with the character. But the, these things also need to feed the story. This is why writers end up getting lost and end up getting stuck. And they're like, oh, I don't know what to do. It's because you didn't define your character well enough to give you information to survive your whole narrative. Um, let's see. Um, uh, what problem, you also need to ask, what problems are they having in their lives? If a character doesn't have problems at the beginning of the story, then you don't have a story because they need to solve a thing. Story, story is basically characters making protagonists. This is, or this is what it makes a protagonist. The protagonist is a person who makes choices. Now these choices can be in the form of physical action, could be in the words form of dialogue, and it could be in the word in the form of um, actual choices, and um, and they have to make choices against an opposing force, and so their choices 
drive the story forward and the opposing force tries to inhibit that driving force. And so a successful protagonist is somebody who ends up overcoming all these things with their decisions. A unsuccessful protagonist is someone who is overwhelmed by all these decisions. And a mixed protagonist is someone whose choices were so complex that they revealed something about them. And in fact, all of these should actually be revealing what the character is and what is important to the character. Uh, the cliche way to do this is to have, you know, a cliff and it's like, uh, you know, the bad guy or the friend or whatever. And then there's the thing that they want and they're like, oh no, I have to make a choice. And then of course they pick up the good, the, the friend and then they're like, yeah, it sucks. I wasn't able to have what I wanted, but I revealed that I'm really good and I'm not willing to let my friend die for the thing I wanted, which is a very extreme and very cliche way to basically showcase the idea. But, you know, you can actually, you can also choose to write subtly. That is a choice, but you don't have to. That's the other thing. Nothing matters. As, as Maya pointed out, Whatever movie, whatever thing you're making, the file format will degrade and fall out of use long before long before the sun explodes. Anyway, the uh, I feel very boomery saying this. Who who is you? Uh, I uh, I flower. I, or I I leaf. Um, we have people who are joining, and I have no idea who they are. Um, Anyway, uh, so the, um, uh, oh, also, um, um, anyway, um, so, uh, now I need to now I need to watch what I'm saying because like some of my examples of bad writing. If this person is somebody who I'm editing for, oh, huh? Oh, you're Lisa. Oh, hi, hi, Katie's Lisa. Uh, okay, good. I can keep talking shit. Anyway, <laughs> speaking of how to start shit, this. Uh, uh, let me see. Um, um, you know, it's actually just now occurred to me that Lapras probably isn't your last name. <laughs> anyway, um, okay, uh, um, let me see, um, okay, so, um, anyhow, a story is, because a character making choices and fighting against an antagonistic force to make these choices to get what they want is a scene. Story is just a series of scenes. And that is less true for fiction, nonfiction, video games, because the video game, you have side quests, you have other things. Um, you know, the, um, you know, uh, like it's hard to say Final Fantasy nine collecting cards that's hard to say that is a scene right um but also in fiction nonfiction, you'll have digressions you'll have musing which is like the narrator taking time to think about what they feel about what just happened and that's not necessarily a scene but when we're talking about plays and talking about screenplays and teleplays it's 100 percent true they are entirely a series of scenes one after the other until completion um and uh let's see so we need to understand uh okay so we talked about the three x structure uh oh and so save the cat also has something that you need sorry i hopped back in my notes uh save the cat uh says a beginning requires six things that need fixing um this is also an idea that I was like, that's fucking dumb when I first heard it. And then over time, I'm like, uh, that's real, isn't it? Okay, so um, I say it depends. I So I personally say that whether or not you need six things that need fixing depends on the story and your ability to drive it. 
Now, I talked to you about my teacher, Sid Field, and so he would teach that your first act needs what are called a dramatic want and a dramatic need. We talked about these in previous things. A dramatic want is often the thing the character is literally chasing in the film. It's the MacGuffin, it's winning the big race, it's defeating the bad guy, it's capturing the Golden Fleece. The dramatic need is usually a spiritual or emotional or abstract goal. Maybe what he wanted was to get the girl, but what he needed... All right, I'm going to time it in like 15 minutes. Okay. Um, all right, so uh, the... Um, thank you. Um, no, I was on dramatic want and need. Uh, so with dramatic want and need, these things are related to the six things, but six things is a lot more shallow than dramatic want and need. Dramatic want is what the character is literally chasing through the film. It's the MacGuffin, it's winning the race, it's defeating the bad guy, it's capturing the Golden Fleece. The dramatic need is the spiritual or emotional or abstract goal. Maybe what he wanted was to get the girl, but what he needed was to learn to respect women. Maybe what he wanted was to, or maybe what she wanted was to win the race, but what she needed was to learn to rely on others. Maybe what he wanted was the Golden Fleece, but what he needed was to learn to appreciate his wife before she poisons those kids and flies away on a dragon um if you know your mythology that was a killer joke anyway um as you do um yeah yes okay cool um let's see uh the answer is uh, you cannot ignore dramatic want. So, so the answer as to whether you can get away with six things versus dramatic want and need, uh, the answer is you cannot ignore dramatic want and need uh, and, and have a quality work. Uh, you're not going to, you're going to have a lot of difficulty surviving. And so when you start to fail your work because you, you're not surviving it, you're going to have to start bringing outside influences. When you start watching, if you start watching Lifetime original Christmas movies, uh, my mom loves these. So I've seen every one of these little white supremacist coded pieces of shit. And so anyway, they start failing to find things to write about. Because basically they're like 20 minutes of story needing to be dragged out to 90 minutes. And so they start bringing outside antagonism. So they'll go to a shop and then there will be a guy who hates Christmas. He's just like, burr, burr, burr. And then the lady needs to confront him and be like, excuse you, Christmas is the best. And people who don't like Christmas are all evil and cause all the wars. And it's like, wait, was that it? that just anti-semitism what right like i fucking hate this but i mean they have that literal coded in like they're like people who hate christmas are fundamentally bad right and it's like as a muslim i feel called out <laughs> um, anyway um and uh, uh that's why i say they're all white supremacists coded anyway um but let's look at the lion king what is Simba's want? If you said to be king, that was a trick. Um, uh, the uh, Simba wants what he thinks being a king will get him, and which is freedom and control of his own life. Simba wants to escape his role in the circle of life. What he needs is to learn and accept the responsibilities of replacing his father as a proper king. Uh, you can go through the whole film of The Lion King in your head right now 
and each fucking scene makes sense being informed by those two ideas that Simba wants to be free in control of his own life he doesn't want to participate in the fucking circle of life of living the living circle and uh but also he had this what this what him being this person does is it creates a dramatic need to be um what this does is it creates a dramatic need for him to accept that role and so that conflict between him and the external world that wants him to accept this role and also the internal parts of him that do want to accept this role are in conflict throughout the whole film there's actually a shakespearean element to him eating bugs because by because the circle of life is also the food chain and so when he starts eating bugs instead of eating friends then he <laughs> then he violates the circle of life right um so <laughs> your cats were doing the the were scar versus simba um yeah lion king is a, con a conformist victory the lion king is that there is a natural order to things which is very shakespearean um and uh i i don't agree with the idea that the lion king is e equals hamlet uh but i do think the lion king is very shakespeare inspired um now we uh now let's think about the Lion King in terms of things that need fixing. Um, things that need fixing are important because they are gifts that the writer grants to themselves from the start of the story to help shape the character and bring in the shape of the scenes. The sixth, um, uh, let's see, um, I skipped a paragraph. Uh, now the six now Lion King does the six things and like Simba the so Simba's six things that need fixing are he can't roar, he can't pounce, um, he doesn't have a mane, he he can't win a fight, uh, he lives a life under constant surveillance, and he's targeted for death by his uncle. Those are six things, some of them are petty, some of them are very complex in the like white supremacist christmas genre what they do is what's a trope i call the um the the, the litany of shit which is basically you have oh the the small town girl going to burp, 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 burp. and then the car breaks down oh no it's always the fucking car um but then it's like but also billy is suspended from school but also christmas is ruined but also the developer is going to bulldoze the town, right? And so, you know, half of those things are related to the actual plot. But the car being fixed usually is not handled with any thematic or plot significance. Because usually what ends up happening is halfway through the movie, the mechanic is like, hey, I'll help you out. We're all about helping people out in this here town. I'll fix your car. Oh, thank you, because I didn't have money. Thank you for gifts from the sky. And then, you know, and then she just has a car again when, when it's convenient for the plot. And you're like, why, why, okay. Okay, well, then that's not really much of a thing because it's kind of a thing that the protagonist almost needs to work on or try. Like, Simba tries to learn how to pounce, and it also even shapes a lot of the scenes because, like, you know, when Mufasa is like, Simba, then he's like, and you still see him because he sucks at it, right? So it's like, it's this ongoing thing that creates what are called complications in screenwriting, which is just like these things that are mentioned a couple of times across that give intentionality to the script. It gives consistency to the script. It gives callbacks for jokes like hiding in the in the grass or, you know, uh, the way Scar manipulates Simba is he says, you need to practice on your roar. And then it's when Simba has the big roar 
that the stampede starts. And so in Simba's mind, his practicing the roar is what caused the stampede. And so he killed his dad, right? Like, it's such a small detail that it's like he, he scream, you know, he's singing a song like, and I'm working on my roar. And right. And then later on, it's like the hyenas are like, fuck you. Who the fuck you think you are? And then he's like, rawr, 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 and they're like, that's it. <laughs> and then later he's practicing the roar as a plot point and the stampede starts. And then later on he comes and he's like, a lion right he's like an adult lion with his roar and he can scream and now he has become the king the inability to roar is uh is a uh i mean most of these like even not having a mane these are um freudian in nature it's like have you gained your masculinity yet because the king is the masculine title right and so it's like it's really about simba trying to claim his masculinity he wants to claim his masculinity by being free by having agency over his life but what he needs to gain is um he also like like he almost his dramatic one is almost like toxic masculinity he wants to care for nobody he wants to only care for himself he wants to bully everyone around he wants to just get whatever the fuck he wants right but that's how he wants to be king but his dramatic need is that he needs to be a positive masculine figure, right? Um, uh, so there's a way to do six wrong things in their life badly, and there's a way to do it well. Um, uh, six, six, uh, and the six things wrong kind of help, um, uh, the six things wrong kind of shape individual scenes, but they don't all, like all six don't show up in every scene. Dramatic want and dramatic need is always there. It's like your emotional baggage. It's always fucking there with you. Um, let me see. Uh, um, you'll also need themes, right? Um, oftentimes you'll discover the themes as you're writing, but in your revisions, you'll want to use your beginning to establish your themes, right? So that becomes kind of a bit of a problem, right? Uh, so you sit down to write with what you think the themes are going to be, but then your second draft, you need to revise it for the themes you found along the way, right? Uh, because you're always going to find a better story than what you had. Uh, when I was working on uh, Tragic Feline, uh, and Save the Cat says... Save the Cat actually goes so far as to say on X page of your beginning, you need to state your theme. Uh, Sid Field says no. Sid Field says just in the beginning you need it. Uh, it's not, Sid Field is a lot less uh, tyrannical and controlling than Save the Cat, which is actually what destroyed Save the Cat because when people started writing Save the Cat screenplays, they did it so much that it was obvious and predictable and and so people stopped using save the cat whereas sid field is still like the basis but the reason why you don't hear about sid field as much is because every person rips off sid field every time i'm reading a book about screenwriting about anything else maybe they reference sid field save the cat referenced sid field as not being quite good enough and acknowledge that they were getting everything like they were starting off Sid Field was their foundation and I was like how fucking dare you um Sid Field was my professor and he died the semester after I took him so and he was also very nurturing and kind and nice to me uh apparently that wasn't true with every student but he was really nice to me and so for me I feel really like protective with Sid Field because like and so when I'm seeing, like, Save the Cat, like, I'm like, fuck you, fuck you, how dare you? Um, but anyway, Sid Field is, is the foundation. I will say, um, Save the Cat is the most impactful. It's the what most people use. Um, Sid Field is the legacy. It's, like, the foundation of all cinema, right? And... 
which Aristotle is the foundation of Sid Field's work, right? Um, and Aristotle is the foundation of all Western literature. And, and then you have Robert McKee, who is per, perhaps the best theorist in the game. Um, so each kind of has their role and why you need to read them. Um, but anyway, uh, but I feel Sid Field gives the most without being a, without being controlling about what your writing can and can't be. Um, so when I was, so, so when it comes to themes, uh, having a central theme really fucking helps. I know some writers who are like, themes are sh Let me see. Um, uh, 30 second warning. Yeah. Um, and yeah, there we go. One more step. And that's that it needed to be installed. Um, uh, okay. Well, well, Maya confirms it. Cause I wasn't sure if I needed to actually wait for the windows dialogue to come up. Okay. Um, so, uh, basically anyway, um, so melancholia is about existential crisis and mental illness. The particular existential crisis explored here is this, that scope determines importance, right? Or it's that, um, you know, masculine structures, or like patriarchal structures give people a diluted sense of importance when there isn't any, right? Um, we've talked about several of the themes so far. Uh, when I was working, on, like, and works have several themes, it's not really just one, uh, but having a central theme really helps. And some, like I was saying when the audio cut out, was that some writers eschew the idea of themes. They're like, themes are a writer getting on a pulpit saying, live your life better. And I'm like, you're fucking in it. Like, it, it, it's really embarrassing to me because one of my earliest mentors has who has given me my foundation of writing has basically pivoted so much in so many dumb ways and he keeps teaching kids and lecturing on these things where he's like at first he was like when i was a student he was like themes are something you find while you're writing which is true but also you can come in like he really taught me this like like he taught me this like sort of semi plan and then find your story as you go. Uh, UCI was like very much don't plan a story, just start typing and then the story will happen. Just have kind of a basic idea and go. Uh, I'm now more of this idea of you need an outline. You need to know basically enough about the story to get excited for it. And that's going to help you go from start to finish. Cause once you have enough of it developed, like, Who's the character? Why? Uh, what perspectives? How are you going to tell the story? What's going to matter in it? Then you start getting excited to fucking step down because you're or step down and step, sit down, fuck, uh, sit down, and then uh, you're going to want to write. Uh, I feel like a lot of how we teach writing teaches the dysfunction that writers tend to have, where they're like, oh, "I'm scared of the white page," and it's like, "Well, yeah, because you weren't taught not to be," right? And so. Um, Anyway, so like, uh, but so when I was writing Tragic Feline Space Program, um, my central theme was coming to terms with being cosmically insignificant, which is coincidentally the same theme of melancholia, or one of the main themes of melancholia. And it, another central theme was like the not a central theme, but another theme or motif was that the um, the way mythos affects us, the way myth and story and stories about grand deeds that live on forever kind of like uh, make us want to achieve these grand ideas, right? And uh, they, so anyway, these guys just... Um, uh, but then as I was working on it, and again, fucking Jocelyn, Jocelyn's all over this. Uh, so I told Jocelyn about it, and she actually found one of my themes where, 
because I I was actually writing characters to be like two parts of the Democratic Party and why we can't get anything. Um, and it was like uh, the violent character is like the the power hungry Democratic Party who also does not give a shit about helping people. And then there's also the other part of the Democratic Party that is like very, very helpful. Um, no, th I think that's what I can't remember how I divided it, but it was like each one had a good trait of the Democratic Party and a bad one. And so it's, it was like one is power hungry, but knows how to lead and get things done. The other one is like um, cares about doing good things but um like but is easily influenced or is too passive right and so um and they're trying to save Laika, the dog in space the the russian the dog the russians launched into space and the um and jocelyn was like yeah this story reminds me of why we can't have faith in the democratic party because uh they're too busy infighting. And so we, like queer people or what, you know, minorities are, are the dog. And we're just going to be left to die because they're too busy working out their own politics. Oh, that's what it was. It was the Joe Biden. That's what Helico's other trait was. It was he, he, he was willing to work with segregationists. Right. Like he was like, we should work with the dogs on this project. <laughs> and that's what is the problem. Right. Um, that that was his his problem with it was that um, the Democrats are willing to compromise with Nazis. And so we can't actually save anybody. Um, anyway. Um, uh, the the. Um, so the first act should show, mention, or otherwise include major characters who will show up later. Uh, in Melancholia, the horse is a character in the second half, but Justine insists on seeing him before the wedding. Uh, there's conflict about it, and the digression is in character, and it reveals exposition through conflict. So it's not just someone having an info dump. They're actually earning the, 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 the inclusion of the the horse even though the inclusion of the horse basically is just about meeting the requirements of well you need to introduce the horse otherwise it seems out of nowhere right yeah the um, i have brought up uh the the recent news story with biden which is we have all this money to set up set aside to build the wall guess we better build it um how biden is expanding trump's border wall and so yeah um uh so the biggest rule about the first act or just the beginning depending on how you structure is that you're creating a contract with the audience you're setting up the genre the characters and the rules if you violate this then your audience will be upset. I want to remind everybody how we watched The Wind Rises. And we were watching sort of a fictionalized creative nonfiction about somebody who actually existed. And then halfway through, Miyazaki said, I want to include this novel that's set around the same time that's about like treating tuberculosis. So then, then we get a love interest with tuberculosis and she dies and we're all like oh no this that was very sad and that's very moving and we are fucking invested in this and that sucks and that hurt our feelings and in a good way that was cathartic it was just drama and we loved it and then it was like oh yeah by the way that was made up lol i was like what the fuck like audiences were very mad because there was nothing in the beginning that suggested this would happen in the end Miyazaki fundamentally violated the contract and I'm not a perfect expert in Easter I'm not even an expert in Eastern uh, storytelling techniques I just know about some of them but uh, but in Western storytelling techniques that is unacceptable you cannot play that shit um, uh, because it pisses people off and um, uh, yeah dem like um 
uh, Chris is saying, I hate how Democrats are sometimes better Republicans than the Republicans are. I say this about Biden and COVID. Uh, Donald Trump said every evil thing Joe Biden executed because Trump did it loudly and told everybody, aren't I smart for thinking if we stop the tests, we stop the, the numbers. And then Joe Biden was like, I'm just going to stop funding the tests. And then, and, and uh, because we don't need the tests anymore. And then, then later on saying, well, the COVID numbers dropped so much, we don't need anything else anymore, right? And so it was like, he created the drop in the COVID numbers by telling the CDC, changing CDC policy and by uh, canceling programs that helped us to monitor. Uh, <laughs> Sharif goes libertarian because Miyazaki violated the contract. Um, well, it's a social contract, which libertarians don't believe in because you don't sign the contract. The audience doesn't sign this contract. Um, so uh, I don't know what the audience would benefit from not signing the contract when they are, I guess, suspension of disbelief. That's part of the audience as part of the contract. When we watch something and you say, we're in space, then the audience agrees to say, okay, in this world, space travel is possible and that all makes sense. As long as the inherent story's logic makes sense, I will be on top. I will be on board. Uh, but if you sit there and look at Star Wars and go like, that's stupid. There's no noise in space. Also, you can't go faster than light. Also, that's not how a laser sword would work. Also, there's no telekinesis. Also, kissing your brother is hot. <laughs> Sorry, I just needed a punchline. Anyway, <laughs> but yeah, if you start doing that, you are violating, the audience then is violating the contract. Um, uh, yeah, you, you, um, uh, let's see uh, Chris is saying uh, the hand wavy it was all a dream thing exists in Asian media but I think the response to it is pretty much the same as it would be to western audiences by now yeah that's also another thing is you have like this cultural contamination western thought on things uh, Katie uh, did a story recently and I had to, I taught her that you can't do the it was all a dream type thing uh, because she created a contract. Sorry, I'm 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 spilling the tea on you, Katie. Yeah. So anyway, um, she told a very heart wrenching story, and then she was like, "And that was like the wildest dream, but it still affected me." And I was like, "Katie, first line you need to say: One time I had this dream that deeply hurt me, that deeply affected me." And and I'm like, because. You can, you can say this, you can put us in that world, but you have to tell us line one, this is a dream because, and the audience will agree with that contract. They'll go along with it. But if you say, uh, here's the thing that happened and they're like, oh my God, then you're like, and it was a dream. You violated the contract, um, because you created a reality one and then said reality two. Um, hold on. I really want to we're going longer than expected because of all the technical difficulties and then I'm getting frazzled and then I normally digress and this was also very long to begin with. Um, the biggest rule about... Uh, okay, that's... Uh, Melancholia tells the audience up front that the planet is going to hit the Earth. Everyone will die. It's not a spoiler. It's part of the basic premise. There is a fake out in the film saying that Melancholia will not hit the planet. But then it does. The prologue of the film makes it so that the film can do that without even being cheap or changing the rules. Uh, it also sets up the plausibility of the fake out very well. And even if it didn't, there's no ex oh also in addition to this, it does set up the the plausibility of the fake out being a fake out very well. Uh, so their, their redundancy is efficiency in storytelling because if someone went to the bathroom during the movie and they come back, then they're going to think that everything is fine. So you do want some redundancy. Um, 
because redundancy is efficiency because especially when with reading people skip sentences that's the one thing i've learned in creative writing is that they always teach you make it as concise as possible say it in one sentence if Insta if you're saying it in two sentences why not just say it in one sentence and it's because people will skip that one sentence so you have to kind of re-establish your rules as you're going um kind of like why i had me and katie read the the lines a second time because i've digressed and so i needed to refresh everyone's memory because you can't trust perfect memory you can't trust perfect recall and so repetition helps the memory so that way the story is not misread um is distracted her plan is coming together yeah i need to i need it, it's easier when i have obs up instead of um All right, I'm having a 13-minute timer, so I'm aware. All right, okay, so um, anyway, um, yeah, so the film does set everything up. Redundancy is effect effectiveness because sometimes the audio gives out and people miss what you said. And uh, But it, you want to help people's memory because they don't have perfect recall. In fact, if you do say it three times they're like in a story, they're likely to only interpret in, take it in one time. Um, and so, uh, so if something is too concise, sometimes you need to come re reapproach it. And, uh, since I've been taking this approach, my writing has gotten a little bit longer, but I've also been getting a lot less, a lot fewer misinterpretations. Uh, more what I get rejections for now is usually, um, character issues. And by character issues, I mean... I made a woke protagonist who's like, racism's a bitch, and I'm going to go be mean to this racist. And then they're like, how is anyone supposed to relate with someone who's mean to racists? And I'm like, that's my save the cat. <laughs> it's like, you relate with this person because they also hate racism. Um, now we understand your writing Stop being so woke. Yeah. Um, yeah, basically that's the problem. Now they get it. <laughs> because... Uh, okay. Um, uh, the prologue tells the entire plot of the film. Oh, so with uh, one reason why I picked Melancholia for teaching how to start things is because the prologue is so long and so detailed. It's like five minutes of just misery and sadness and slow motion with images you don't know how to understand yet and so we talked about with summer wars how uh hosoda will give you or most most directors now will give you um will give you the key to understanding the ending at the very beginning because there is a, another structure thing which is the beginning needs to include the end not necessarily give away the ending, but it should be related in some sense to the ending. So that way, um, there was a there was a fiction writer who said, "I could write a million endings, but I have trouble writing a oh, oh no, I could write a million beginnings, but I have trouble with endings." And you know, I heard this when I was younger, so I was just like, "Oh yeah, that makes sense." And then, but now that I know what I do, I'm like, no, you've never learned how to write a single beginning. <laughs> if you can't write your ending, it's because you didn't write a good beginning. Every single story problem I end up, when I'm editing someone's thing, every single story problem is they did not set up a story. They don't know how to write beginnings. When I took Sid Field's class, he only taught us the first 30 pages of a screenplay because that's all you really need. The rest of it, if you've taken any other writing courses, but you understand how to survive the first 30 pages, you understand the rest of the screenplay. I even, in my next writing class, screenwriting class, I was like, 
can we talk about the later parts of the screenplay? And they, they didn't know what to do because everybody teaches the first 30 pages because that's what Sid Field emphasized and everybody's just ripping off Sid Field. And so, the um, but, but over time, I've kind of come to realize that like, um, you know, the rest of the screenplay is not as important as just the beginning. Um, Save the Cat goes into some of the rest of the screenplay um, badly. Um, uh, Seven Basic Plots is more of a better guide. That's by Christopher Booker. That teaches a five-act structure, which I use to superimpose on a three-act structure. They actually line up really well because they all have the same requirements in the same spots. Storytelling! Anyway, um, and so... Uh, I just overlap these structures, and so um, that's how I kind of learned the rest of storytelling, uh, or the rest of screen pl screenplay storytelling. Uh, fiction is a different game, slightly, um, but anyway. But in terms of structure, they're they're kind of the same. Um, let's see. Um, the last thing I'll be covering is the opening. Uh, sorry, this is a very um, sorry, this is a very um, long introduction, but I kind of um, friends are trying to. Uh, so Kat's team is trying to. Um, they're starting the writing phase of their their game, and so I'm very much trying to be like, here is all the things you need to know to start a thing and survive, and it's a like weeks of creative writing classes that I'm trying to put one lecture. So thank you for being patient. Um, we will get to this movie, I swear. It's not as bad as Azumanga Daio, but it's a little, it's getting there. Uh, so, so uh, there's also, so um, openings. Um, one type that's very common, and in fact, some people will say it's the only opening, is the hook. The hook is a um, is a controversial or like impressive or um, um, engaging sentence or opening image depends on your form that uh, is a way to make the audience want more. Uh, it's something that's usually high energy and gets you right into it. Uh, the hook should... Uh, one book I edited, they had a good hook where something exploded right off the bat. And it had nothing to do with the fucking story. Um, in fact, even the next few paragraphs said, yeah, and then I went to a different building and, and then, you know, three years later... And I'm like, I'm like a hundred pages into this fucking thing. And I'm like, that building had nothing to do with anything. You just wanted something exciting at the very beginning of your fucking book. That's bullshit, right? That's a bad contract. If you have buildings explode in your first sentence, and the first sentence is very contracty. First paragraph is very contracty, but not as much as the first sentence. And then the first chapter is also contracty after that your story is going in fact actually that's why publishers will ask for the first chapter before reading the rest of it because they want to have they want to see what contract you've made with the readers and whether that's going to be something they want to sell or even read um and uh so so your your hook does your your opening does need to be even if it's exciting it needs to be plot related it needs to sell what the genre is right there's also kind of a truth and advertising um setup this is just this is what the story is um this isn't necessarily powerful on its own and may rely on the next pair the rest of the paragraph to really make it go forward uh or it could be powerful on itself you can combine all these openings in fact it's better if you do um, one, uh, the, probably the most famous truth in advertising kind of metaphor for the whole story, uh, which is also a 
good opening is making a metaphor for what your whole story is is Virginia Woolf's uh, opening to Mrs. Dalloway, which is just Mrs. Dalloway thought she would buy the flowers herself that day. That tells you the main character is Mrs. Dalloway. That tells you, like, it's just going to be kind of... It tells you the genre. She's probably not going to be fighting ninjas. She's probably not going to be in a samurai showdown. She's just... But it also tells her, tells us what her social class is. She is buying him for herself today because that would be exciting right um and um uh let's see um yeah there's also some that tease the story to make the audience want to know what's going to happen you want to try to get them to the next sentence um my first well so for um uh, my story first canine uprising uh, I think has the best opening I've seen in anything, um, except maybe Virginia Woolf's love, not Virginia Woolf, Sylvia Plath's love set you going like a fat gold watch, uh, because the rest of that poem, because it's, um, it has two meanings. Uh, one is like an Alice in Wonderland, like I'm late, I'm late, I gotta go. Uh, but also there's another meaning, which is a uh, gold watch is what they give you when you're fired. And so love set you going, like set you off, set you out. Um, but love is also how the the baby was created. Also, this is an opening for a poem, not even like a novel or a story. It's just, and the rest of the poem is about worshipping the baby as a god. And you could read it as, we are worshipping this baby as a god. Or you can look at it as, look at this fucking baby. That needs make us worship it like a goddamn god. Both readings are perfectly valid. And so it's like ambivalently two things. Yes, redundant, but yeah. Redundancy is efficiency. It's ambivalently two things at the same time. And um, uh, anyway, my story's opening of First Canine Uprising is There once was a boy who liked cats. This is the story of his dog. Yeah, Raja. And and that is like the biggest opening. Like like it tells you what it's about. It's very interesting. It it gets you into the deal. Um Meow indeed. Uh we are at like the one minute timer or not one minute, but I I put mine for thirteen minutes, so anyway, um let's see. Uh, finally, the most common opening in the world is the metaphor, which I talked about a little bit. But let's talk about it, how for movies, this is a part of the medium. This is the part of the form, right? Now, this could be kind of violated, right? It's the, the 14, it's the braided essay. It's the, it's the second level of do not violate these rules. Um, but it's the most common opening for cinema to create a metaphor that captures the entire piece. And I think I say we'll talk about that at the end. Um, um, but in Melancholia, the opening shot is Justine facing the camera without a care in the world. And three, bird, three dead birds fall from the sky behind her. You can argue that the whole opening prologue. You can also argue that the whole opening prologue is the opening sequence. A sequence is a series of scenes that act as a scene. Um, and while this is true, I'd say the first shot in this sequence is doing double duty um, because it is like in the way that the first sentence and the first paragraph work together to set off that contract of being the most beginning of the beginning. Uh, the first sentence and the opening scene are the most beginning of the beginning. Um, and they're doing the most work of the beginning. Um, all right. Uh, okay. Oh shit. We're in trouble.
Yeah, let's take a break right now. Um, we're going to start the movie soon, but I just realized if this thing cuts out every 15 minutes, how are we going to audio? Raja's concerned too. I think let's, oh no, I got an idea. I'm going to swap two cables around and I think it solves the problem. <laughs> Oh yeah, so if if we want to, I'm sorry, this was all lecture and an hour late and all this shit. But let's see. Uh, um, let's let's see. Let's just get it. Let's just start the film. Let's take a five minute break and then we'll come back and uh, we'll we'll try to get this going. Oh, I know how to do it. Okay, good. I got it. I got it. I know. I don't. We don't need to fuck with anything. I got it. Okay. Uh, I know. I know what to do. We're we're good. Uh, take. We'll we'll come back.